Welcome back to Law and Crime, everybody. We're still breaking down the verdict in the Ashley MacArthur courtroom. She was found guilty of first degree murder with a firearm. She was sentenced to an automatic life in prison without the possibility of parole, plus 25 years for the firearm component. Right now, though, joining me is a very special guest to break this down. We saw him day in and day out. Ashley MacArthur's defense attorney, John Barrisette, is with us. Mr. Barrisette, great to have you, and thanks, and welcome to Law and Crime. Well, thanks for having me on. First place I want to start, you know where I'm going, is the verdict. So, what's your reaction to it? You know, obviously, we're, we're very disappointed. I mean, we, we put years of preparation into this, and, you know, we, we thought we had built a good defense. Obviously, Ms. Jensen did a great job. She had a lot of really good evidence on her side, but disappointed. And how's Ms. Uh, MacArthur doing after that uh, verdict came down as well as the sentence? Well, uh, actually, I have not uh, seen her since she left the courtroom on Friday afternoon. I will be going to see her later this week to tell her, of course, talk about our, all her options, including her appeal rights. So I don't know. I did speak to her mother on Saturday, and obviously it's hard on the whole family. Yeah, and I want to talk about the appeal. I mean, what is some of the strategies, if you can speak to us about, you know, grounds for an appeal? Is it the idea of the photo that was shown in the courtroom? Is there something else that you felt was improperly admitted? I'm curious uh, the strategy moving forward. Sure. I think there are a lot of good issues on appeal. As you know, um, prior to trial, we filed several motions to suppress. One of the motions I believe the most in was we filed a motion to suppress her statement on October 19, 2017, that she gave to law enforcement. Uh, in that statement, uh, it came out at the hearing, not at the trial, but at the motion to suppress hearing, that law enforcement lied to get her down to the police station. They then put her in a room and kept her in there for five to 10 minutes by herself. They then came in and engaged in talk with her for probably 10 to 15 minutes, you know, just small talk, but also talk about the case. Then, after doing that and kind of making her feel comfortable, letting her guard down, they read her her Miranda rights, which the officer said, I'm going to breeze through these real quick, so downplaying their significance. So, you know, she got midstream Miranda warnings. The officer clearly downplayed the significance of those warnings, and we don't believe that statement should have been admitted into evidence. But you mentioned other issues. There, were, there was issues, of course, with the photograph being shown to the jury. I, I asked for a mistrial on that. I think uh, that was a huge mistake, given the nature of the charge and the allegation to have a gun being pointed by our client right at the jury. Um, we moved in limine to keep the state from talking about the 38 that they put into evidence because there was really no connection. Not really. There was no connection of that firearm to the murder of Taylor Wright and just letting a random firearm into evidence we thought was extremely prejudicial. So those are just a couple of them. I think there are many more issues though. So, you know, look, it sounds like there's some grounds here and it sounds like she's in very capable hands. I mean, it was a pleasure to watch you, you and your father day in and day out uh, doing this. By the way, just a little side note, what was it like trying this case uh, alongside your father? I mean, I haven't seen that. Uh, it's, you don't always see that kind of teamwork. Can you give us an insight into what that family dynamic is like? Sure. Yeah, I think uh, my father and I probably tried, I don't know, five or six different cases together. Um, I worked in his law firm from 2006 to March of this year. March of this year, I started my own law firm. Um, not for any bad reasons, just, you know, I'm, it's time for me to do this on my own. But uh, it's, it's awesome working with him. He's a, a very skilled attorney. He's been doing this since the 70s. He's seen everything he has. We do have different styles, uh, which is fine. Uh, but he certainly thinks of a lot of things that I don't think of and vice versa. And it was it was fun. It may be the last case that we ever try together. I, I don't know because right now we don't have any others together and I, I do have my own law firm, but uh, certainly it was a pleasure um, working with him. He, he's a great attorney and, and, you know, under all the stress and pressure we were under, we still had fun with each yeah. other. Yeah, it was good to see the back and forth and see how you switched it up. Um, I do want to get into actually the details of this case and try to understand it because from our perspective, we see one thing. From your perspective, you see another. So during the course of this case, you tried to raise reasonable doubt in a number of different areas, trying to say that your client didn't do this. But then the question is, who did do this? So is there an idea 
that you have about who might have done this? I mean, it was sort of implied there were other characters in Taylor Wright's life, uh, but what we didn't see was, uh, you know, during a closing or an opening, directly pointing the finger at somebody else. So I'm curious, who else might have done this? Well, I, I'm not going to say who. I think, you know, here's the here's what happened. You know, of course, we had a private investigator work with us on this case. So anybody that your viewers or you may have thought of done, of course, we, we checked them out. That, that's what we did. Um, I, I don't know who else could have done it. I wasn't really worried about that. We did check these people out, um, but we just didn't think they could prove Ashley did it, and it's not our job as defense attorneys to give them alternative. Of course, that would be nice. Yes, absolutely. But what, let's say this. What happens if we say, all right, well, person A did it or person B did it, and clearly the state could then show that person A or person B did not do it. Then we felt like we would lose all credibility with the jury after that because they would then say, well, the defense is saying it's this person. It's clearly not. How can we believe anything else uh, that the defense says. So, but we certainly, yes, we checked and looked at possible other suspects, but sometimes, you know, you just don't get what you want. Yeah, and I completely agree, obviously. The defense doesn't have to point the finger. They don't have to prove a case. They just have to raise reasonable doubt. But you talk about what the prosecution's case is. Let's go through it a little bit. The Home Depot video of her buying the potted soil, the concrete, the day after... Taylor Wright goes missing. How do we explain that? That's well, not good, is it? Um, you know, as, as you know, um, I don't get to pick and choose my evidence. So, you know, they unfortunately, law enforcement had that video and there was nothing I could do to keep it out. So, you know, what and maybe, you know, what we tried to give the jury on that and um, maybe we didn't do the best job. I don't know, is a couple things. One. First of all, you heard her husband, Zach MacArthur, talk about uh, during his examination that uh, they were doing some work around their house on Rain Tree, not only in the basement, but in there was some yard work going on and a new deck had recently been built. So there was that testimony. But I think the most powerful thing is, and I guess the jury disagreed, is the state had all this time and they made no effort to do any type of forensic testing of this to say, yes, this is exactly the same potting soil because they knew the brand. Uh, this is exactly the same concrete because they knew the brand. And in fact, if you recall, Mr. Sims came in from Home Depot uh, and described them as different. But I guess that didn't carry much weight for the jury because he described Mr. Sims described the uh, the um, concrete, excuse me, as being very fine and dust like where clearly the concrete that was found on Miss Wright was uh, rockier and had more pebbles, whatever you call it, in it. Yeah, in my opinion, you guys did a great job of saying, look, there's no DNA evidence, there's this lack of scientific evidence. However, the problem is her buying that on camera and given the time frame and given where the victim was found and in the condition of the victim's remains, you could see how they all tied it together and how the jury maybe didn't need a definitive answer of that, yes, this is the same exact brand, they just needed to be told that point of the story. If you go on, though, you, you did try to explain a way, especially in your opening statement, about the police interrogation tape and some of the things that she said. So if you could explain, what was she trying to do in that police interrogation tape? And there were two that we saw there, right? We saw the one a week and about a week after Taylor Wright goes missing. And then we fast forward to the one on October 19th when the remains are found. So what's your opinion of what she's been said to investigators? Because she wasn't, she didn't lawyer up. She did speak to them and tried to give her perspective about what happened. So what do you make of it? Well, what I make of it is this is a classic example for everybody out there, whether you're guilty or innocent of a crime, is do not talk to law enforcement uh, without at least first consulting with an attorney and understanding your rights and what law enforcement can do. Because obviously, you know, I mean, those, those statements are very difficult to deal with. And like I said, we moved to suppress one of them. But once the judge said, you know, denied our motion, they're coming in. You know, so there really wasn't much I could do to explain those other than saying, you know, that I was trying to be upfront with the jury that clearly Mrs. MacArthur was not completely honest and forthcoming with the jury. I mean, excuse me, with the police in these statements. And I think in my opening statement, I even said the phrase that she lied. You know, I was trying to take some of the wind out of the prosecutor's sails uh, right. because statements were coming in. They were what? 
five, six hours of statements from her. You know, we didn't even play, or the, the government didn't even play her phone calls. They were admitted into evidence. But there were, you know, more, there was just too many statements. And, you know, I, yeah. I would again caution everybody just, you know, don't talk to the police until you've had a chance to consult with an attorney. This is a classic, classic case for years to come that people can look back on and say, you know, clearly her own statements had a huge effect on the outcome of this case. I guess the other and the other question would be is sometimes what we've seen where defendants want to explain away comments that they've made or why they said certain things in certain police interviews is they take the stand and they take the stand, they explain their perspective, they explain what was going on and they give their side of the story. We didn't see that here. Was there a discussion about her taking the stand and what might have that what might that have looked like? Well, of course, you know, we're required to, uh, I don't know if they showed it on TV, but we went into a, a back room, my father and I and Ashley MacArthur. I think we were back there for 10 minutes. I, I'm not going to talk about what the discussion was because of attorney-client privilege, but of yes, there was, a lengthy, there was a lengthy discussion, I would say, for at least 10 minutes. And, and of course, that wasn't the first time that we had talked to her about the pros and cons of testifying. Um, and ultimately, it is, you know, there's a few decisions that the defendant gets to make, not the attorney. And, you know, she made the decision she made. I, again, I'm not going to say what we talked about, but, you know, uh, it, it clearly would have been hard for her to testify with all her statements out there. Uh, because, I mean, look, Ms. Jensen's a very skilled prosecutor. I think all she does is, is homicide cases. You know, I imagine if Mrs. MacArthur took the stand that basically if I was a prosecutor, I would just retry the whole case and go through every misrepresentation or lie that she told police. And it's almost like the state then could go back and do their case a second time right with our client. Mm -hmm. Now, but again, it, it's Mrs. MacArthur's decision on, on what she wants to do with that. She, we had a conversation and she told the judge she didn't want to testify. Completely understandable. John Barrisett, thanks so much for coming on. It was a pleasure to watch you day in and day out uh, trying this case, and uh, we'll make sure to follow the latest developments in the Ashley MacArthur uh, saga. But again, thank you so much for coming on, and hopefully maybe we get a chance to see you again on the network in a different case. I appreciate it. Y'all have a great day. You too. All right, everybody, let's take a break. When we come back, we have a lot more to cover.